Please be seated. Our reading today comes from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. Listen, even though this text might seem familiar or you've read it many times or you've never heard it before, just listen with fresh ears, an open mind, and an open heart. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locust and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. The word of God for the people of God. God. Westminster is incredibly blessed. While we mourn and grieve together with our senior pastor Jeff and his wife Julie over their son, over the death of their son John. Um, yet God has equipped us to go on, to walk on together. May that be staff, may that be clergy or lay, and really impressive people from within our congregation are gifted and are willing to give this gift and share it with all of us. So I invite Mitch Revord to bring us the word. Let me move this. Oh, I do have some. I'm going to ask you to pray for me this morning with this running water constantly going behind me. One of two things are going to happen. I'm either going to have to run off to the restroom or I'm just going to doze right up here. So, okay. All right. I love this group. And we're here today to reflect on our baptisms and to think about baptism. And Pastor Susie selected chapter 1, verses 4 to 11 as the scripture reading for today and asked that I speak on this subject. So I read the scripture and I prayed on it and I I felt the following message was laid on my heart. And so let me begin. Mark chapter 1, verse 4 reads, And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. A baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. There was an ex-convict that lived in Oklahoma named Kurt. Kurt was a Christian and a member of the Church of Christ who insisted every new believer undergo a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As an active member of his church, he served in his own cottage ministry where he reached out to other ex-convicts, introducing them to Jesus Christ and trying to integrate them back into society. Well, one day in early 1994, Kurt was watching television. And on that television was an interview with a notorious convict that was imprisoned in Wisconsin. During the course of that interview, the convict remarked that his greatest wish was that he could just find some peace. 
When Kurt heard these words, he knew in his heart he had the answer for that man. Peace in Jesus Christ. Because Kurt was in Oklahoma and the convict was way off in Wisconsin, Kurt did the only thing he knew what to do. He found one of his Bible correspondence courses that he gave other ex-convicts, and it laid out the steps to repentance and salvation. And with a stamp and a prayer, he mailed it off to Wisconsin. Months passed. And one day, Kurt opened his mailbox, and in the mailbox was a package. In the package was the Bible correspondence course, with all the questions answered and all the essays filled out. Also in that package was a letter. In the letter was a thank you and a declaration from the convict that he had completed all the steps to repentance and to, into salvation and that he was now ready to be baptized. Kurt took immediate action. His next step was to find a Wisconsin minister that would go into that prison and baptize that convict. After calling several ministers who refused out of fear for their safety, Kurt eventually located Pastor Roy from Madison, Wisconsin. Pastor Roy agreed to go to that prison, meet with the convict, and confirm the sincerity of his repentance. After several face-to-face -face meetings and Bible study sessions, Pastor Roy was convinced that this convict was sincerely repentant and had truly accepted Christ as his personal Savior. Therefore, on May 10, 1994, Pastor Roy baptized Jeffrey Lionel Dahmer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is how Jeffrey Dahmer the serial killer we know as the Milwaukee monster or the Milwaukee cannibal because how he murdered 17 men and boys came to be a Christian. As told in the book, Dark Journey, Deep Grace, Jeffrey Dahmer's story of faith. Mark chapter 1 verse 11 reads, And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. My beloved son, in who I am well pleased. I now want to take you to a New York State maximum security penitentiary. There's a Christian there named Rick. He's in a prison that's the home for the worst of the worst. Rick had become a Christian while in prison and believed any person who truly repented could become a beloved child of God. As Rick prayed in his cell block each night to do God's will, it was impressed upon his heart to witness to an extremely violent and psychotic prisoner that was in the same prison with Rick. No one ever approached or talked to this guy. But one day in 1987, Rick walked across the prison yard and approached the most unapproachable man in that prison and simply said these words, I know who you are, and I want to tell you something. I want you to know that Jesus Christ loves you, and he has a plan and purpose for your life. Rick also gave the man a pocket-sized Gideon Bible. The man took the Bible, and he read it, and he read it again, and he read it again, and yet again. And then one winter night, while reading Psalm 34, he came to these three passages. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. And upon reading that last verse, he saved him all out of all his troubles. A spirit of repentance swept over that man, and Richard David Berkowitz fell to his knees, cried tears before God, confessed his sins, and accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. This is how David Berkowitz, the serial killer known as the son of Sam and the 44 caliber killer, because of his shooting attacks that killed six people and wounded seven others, became a Christian. 
as told in the book, The Son of Hope, The Prison Journals of David Berkowitz. And Mark chapter 1, verse 5 reads this. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. All the people went out to him. And so here is my core message. We are a United Methodist Church. According to a recent study, United Methodists are suffering a net loss of about 116,000 members in the United States every year. That is the equivalent of a church of our size just disappearing every day of the year. This has been the trend in our denomination for decades. If this rate of decline is not reversed, it is statistically feasible that by 2050, just 30 years from now, the United Methodist Church in America could become extinct. This United Methodist Church was founded in 1952. Will we still be here in 2052? How can we, as the heirs of this church, become a victor over and not a victim of this ravaging trend? Our church's mission is to love God, make friends, and serve others. And every active member knows that we truly honor that mission. Our worship services reflect our love for God. Our church family is a network of, of close friendships. We help each other. We pray for each other. We really care about each other. And because of the generosity of many members of our church in both time and money, we serve those in need on a regular and consistent basis. So I ask you today, why are not more people in our community coming to us? Why are not our seats filled? I believe we are a godly people with a godly purpose. So where is the disconnect? When Susie asked me to read these passages and give a message on them today, I believe, after praying and reading these, that the answer to that question lies right here in these verses from Mark. What Mark is telling us is something so significant yet so subtle. What Mark is telling us is that Jesus came not just to serve, but to save. Jesus submitted to John's baptism to show us that John's message and his message were one and the same. His act of baptism was acknowledgement to all of us that repentance for the forgiveness of sins is the starting point for every Christian life and the foundational basis of every Christian ministry. Mark reminds us that the very first message Jesus ever preached was one of repentance. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15 read, After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Repent. A spirit of service without a spirit of salvation is not enough. Service and salvation must go hand in hand to ensure real spiritual power in the body of Christ. John Wesley taught us as much. And because Methodists believed it and they practiced it, Methodism exploded in America. By 1820, it became the largest Protestant denomination in the United States and stayed so for the next 150 years. One biographer said John Wesley acted as though he were out of breath in the pursuit of souls. So let it be with us. I began this talk with two examples of what I felt were unbelievable conversions. Kurt in Oklahoma was a principal catalyst in the conversion of Jeffrey Dahmer, and all he did was send the man a Bible correspondence course. Rick in New York prison was a principal catalyst in the conversion of David Berkowitz, and all he did was give a word of encouragement and a Bible. 
if two of the most vile human beings in contemporary American history can be led to Christ, initiated by such simple means, how much more can we do in our community with this facility we're in, with this staff that we have, and with this great congregation? I have shown through these examples that what one really only need do is to open the door to grace. And should a person walk through, God does all the rest. But if no one makes the effort ever to open that door, no person is ever going to pass through. So let us consistently and persistently open that door to others. Now, Please understand that I'm not up here today to criticize any person or program. And, and if I've done that, I've, I've messed up and I've failed. But I love this church. And I support this staff. I believe our programming is spirit-led. And in my heart, I know we're doing God's work. I, I know we are. But what I'm saying here today is that as a church, we must now consider ourselves ready. We should now be focusing on adding members to this church. In other words, evangelism. This goal should infuse all of our programs from now on. Making members is bringing people to Christ. Adding members to our church is the making of disciples as commanded by Christ in his great commission. Let us therefore not shy away from this task. Let us not be ashamed or afraid of focusing on numbers. Let us continue, continue to serve others as we have in the past, but now let us do so with the intention of saving them as well. I believe if we do so, if we can integrate service and salvation, if we can have the same, then we can have the same spiritual power in our ministries that existed in early Methodism. And then... We will be the victor and not the victim. We are the heirs of salvation. This is the meaning of our baptisms. We are heirs of what Christ in this church have done for us. As heirs, it is our responsibility and our obligation to continue the legacy of our predecessors. So as we begin 2019, let us equally serve and save. The spirit of service and the spirit of evangelism should carry equal weight in all that we do. Together we can grow this church, expand our ministries, and transform this community. Let us together create a legacy for Westminster United Methodist Church that extends not just to our children, but to our grandchildren and to their children yet to come. Let us pray. Lord, you once told your disciples that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. We pray, Lord, for you to send us to the harvest, for we are ready, we are willing, and we are able. Amen.